When I was a kid, I loved choose your own adventure books. I just loved being in control and having some influence over how the story went and where it took me and how it ended. And um, I just loved being a part of that process. And in truth, modern media is not all that different from those days when we did choose your own adventure right now. We have many, many creators and we all have the opportunity to be creators and we all are much more involved in and can influence media even as an audience right even as we are in the audience and that's really the foundation of what we're going to look at today in terms of reception analysis which has to do with um, the audience's role in in uh, critiquing and understanding the media so this is one of the lenses uh, critical lenses that we want to put in our in our tool belt to use in our exploration of critical media studies okay? So reception analysis very simply examines the role of the audience in the process of meaning making in the media. So in other words, even if we're not creating the actual artifact, we as an audience influence how that media is received because we are the ones who give it meaning. There are a couple of kind of related theories to reception analysis that uh, they're over the process of time or, you know, of course, time has kind of evolved from a collection of different things. Um, one of those would be hypodermic needle um, theory or the hypodermic needle approach, which says media just kind of injects us with all these ideas and this information and stuff. Uh, so, I mean, this is kind of the start almost of media studies way back in the day. So and there we kind of have evolved into some different things. Um, so things like the two-step flow approach so basically the two-step flow um, says that media doesn't just um, you know inject kind of straight into the individual the media sends information uh, though to an individual um, to an opinion leader specifically or to opinion leaders who then will influence um, individuals which you almost kind of have a new appreciation for or understanding for now when we have the literally the role of influencer right via social media people that um, companies will send products to and say, will you promote this with your followers? And so we have, I mean, it's really a job of influencer now. It's now formalized, but it's always kind of been a part of, of uh, some media strategy to identify opinion leaders and really um, gain their approval so that then they will um, discuss that with the individual. So you don't necessarily, as a media person, need to reach every individual if you can reach those opinion leaders. That's two-step flow approach. So that's another part of of how we have looked at media over the years and is related to reception analysis. Uh, another is cultivation analysis and how does media, call, you know, the media kind of influences as, as, as young children and how does that, you know, then um, uh, unfold over time and just, you know, variety. So you can examine cultivation uh, analysis and, and, uh, and, and how it influences reception analysis. Agenda setting theory is certainly one that we've got that the idea that media doesn't tell us what to think, but they tell us what to think about. In other words, they are the ones selecting what information is, is coming to us. So they don't necessarily tell us what to think, but they do have an, a large degree of influence over what we think about. Uh, and then uses and gratification theory is another one that you can um, examine just the idea that, to, that we um, select and, and process media in a way that best suits our needs and our goals really in, in trying to achieve um, those goals. So I, this, you know, we throw all this stuff in a blender over time, media theory evolves and all this kind of informs how we get to reception analysis. So you can examine um, those more in depth uh, as you wish, but, uh, but this, is just, these are all can just kind of leading into and influencing reception analysis. Reception analysis really though starts with um, Stuart Hall, in 1973 created created what he called the encoding and decoding model uh, as it relates to media so and very simply the encoding and decoding model says that uh, first of all there are frameworks of knowledge and relations of, of production and technical infrastructure and all of these things go into creating so the people who are creating the media have all these things and they, that all gets bundled up and, and goes into creating or uh, creating the media or encoding um, this message, right? To they encode the message through this media, right? and they so they they are encoding some sort of meaning, presumably through what they're creating, and that's coming from the creators of the media. 
At the same time, you have individuals on the other side, right, who also have frameworks of, of knowledge and, and relations of production and technical infrastructure, all of those things that relate to the people who are receiving this media, the audience, right? And then they go through the process using all of that as a filter of decoding this information. And then combined together, we end up with this, uh, this program is meaningful discourse, right? So it's not just the creator and it's not just the audience, but it's this combination and, and specific interpretation of those things based on how the audience receives it, but also how the, the uh, people create it. And that is what gives us this creation of meaningful discourse, this combination of these things. So, and that, that's all well and good. That was, an, again, this evolution of understanding media. This was an important step forward in understanding the impact of and the, the um, kind of the receivership of this and the role of the audience in that. Um, and, and we can see this in music in a lot of ways for me. I, I see it a lot in music. When I was a kid, I listened to a lot of rock music, right? I love Def Leppard and, and, uh, especially the song, pour some sugar on me. That was, I was in middle school when that song came out. I just loved it. Loved the guitars, loved all the flash. And, and you know, I remember distinctly one of my older brothers saying to me, do you know what that song means? Why are you singing that song? Do you know what it means? I said, well, of course I know what it means. Of course, I didn't have any idea what it meant. What it meant to me was it was fun and it was a lot of rock music and stuff. So it was fun. So I didn't know what pour some sugar on me meant, what they were really talking about. So the, the, the creator's message was lost on me, but I had my own message from that. And I remember also, uh, if you recall the, the song More Than Words by Extreme, I remember speaking to an adult friend of mine who was shocked to learn that more than words wasn't referring to, you know, well, I'll do the dishes. I'll, I'll do more than just say, I love you. I'll do the dishes for you. I'll rub your feet. I'll do these things. But that more than words actually meant, I want you to have sex with me. I don't just want, you know, you to say you love me. I want you to show me you love me by having sex with me. And he was just shocked as an adult, even to hear this. He was like, oh my gosh, I never really thought about that before. You know, and it's not just old rock music for people like me. It's younger stuff. I had the same similar conversation with our, with our then young, uh, youngish daughter who was singing Blake, Blank Space by Taylor Swift. For all you Swifties, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. But, and so I asked her, you know, you're singing the song, you know, every word. So what does it mean, though? And what do you think that message is to say that you've had a long list of lovers and that's all gone bad, but you've got a blank. So you'll give it a try with somebody else. And so oh, what does that mean? To you? Is that something you think when you're in a relationship that somebody wants to hear? Well, yeah, I've had a long list of lovers. That's that's not necessarily what every person wants to hear. So, I mean, just think about what you're saying, what the song means, what it, you know, what it's getting at. And then you could do the same kind of thing with, you know, how many kids did you see running around uh, singing watermelon sugar with no idea what it meant or what, you know, the, the meaning behind that song, what it was getting at the, the double entendre or blurred lines without understanding that it is about drug use and things. But they're fun songs to sing. They're fun. And so how much thought do we put into it? I don't know. And they, these people had meaning when they created them, but we also interpret them in different ways as an audience. So, so expanding on really what the work that Stuart Hall was doing there with encoding and decoding, then John Fisk came along, a researcher named John Fisk came along and said, really, there's more than even just that going on and developed this idea of what we call polysemy, uh, which literally just means many meanings. Right. So Stuart Hall said, yes, there are, multi, there are two meanings, what the creator uh, is putting into this and what the uh, person listen, listening to it or, or, or viewing this artifact uh, interpreted as. Um, but Fisk said there's really even more than that going on, this polysemy or many meanings. What he meant by that is just a relative openness of media texts or artifacts to multiple interpretations so that it could be inter interpreted in multiple different ways. It's not just what the creator intended and what one person said. There's more to it than that through polysemy, he said. So, um, so again, many meanings here is what we're getting at. Um, so Fisk said, yes, there are frameworks of knowledge. And then the, this is encoded by the, the creator. It goes into that program as meaningful discourse. It's also decoded by an audience. Clearly, it's decoded by that audience, but there are multiple audiences that are going to take um, different meanings from that. So you're going to have multiple meanings or polysemy, right? Multiple, many meanings from that. And they're all going to be working from different frames of knowledge and, and relations to production, all these things. Right? So every audience and every audience member really is going to be interpreting it differently. So there are multiple meanings um, and many meanings here in, that, that Fisk pointed out through polysemy. 
Okay, so it's not just on one side and then the other side. There, there's, the audience side has tons of different opportunities. Then another researcher named Celeste Condit came along, and I'm just summarizing all this briefly, of course, and, and it, it, so there's much more to, to understand to this, but uh, just to give you a basic idea, Celeste Condit came along and said, yes, that is true. All of that is true, um, and, but all of this research really is is not really um, addressing the marginalized audiences, right? So media is largely created by and intended for and interpreted by and, and all the research that was going into this was focused on uh, media created by and intended for um, essentially white people probably middle class white people um, and really that's that's what we're looking at here but there are tons of marginalized audiences that expand this even further in what she called polyvalence so this multiples of multiples and, and distinctly different understandings of that media and the impact that it has on these communities so we have not just polysemy but polyvalence again this continuing evolution of how we look at media and the audiences engagement and interpretation uh, of these different artifacts the next kind of evolution in the uh, came from uh, a researcher named leah cecciarelli who who popularized this, these different types of polysemy and said really there are different there are different categories of polysemy different types of polysemy that we see um, she started with one or uh, there were three categories starting with one that she called resistive reading which had to do with polysemy is the quality of the audience. So thinking about, as we've been talking about the audience's role in this and, and the multiple uh, meanings that, that come from um, the different audience members and, and people uh, interacting with this artifact. There was also what she called strategic ambiguity, which had to do with uh, polysemy as a quality of the artifact creator. So first of all, a, a lot of media is created by more than one person. So you have more than one frame of reference, more than more than all of these, you know, multiples in the creation process. Right? So there, there's some strategic ambiguity, um, but that and that is the um, polysemy or the different meanings that are that are a uh, result of the choices made by that artifact creator okay, or creators, plural. Then we also have what she called hermeneutic depth. Hermeneutic, sorry, I'll get it out. Hermeneutic depth which is polysemy is a quality of the critic or analyst. So the people take on, you know, we put on again, our different lenses and that gives us different meanings. So not only are we individuals coming at this with our own frame of reference and things, but when we, when we act as a critic or an analyst, then we put on a wholly different kind of lenses and, and we see a different kind of examination, different kind of meaning. You see this, you know, um, while I love um, the, the Muppets and, the, and, and, um, and they're, you know, kindly gentlemen in the audience offering their helpful advice. We can also see this in movie critics, for example, when we see different movie critics that will look at, a, at an artifact, the same movie and, and come to different conclusions, but they're looking at it in a slightly different light even than than like a resistive reading or uh, certainly is a strategic ambiguity so uh, hermeneutic depth has to do with the uh, critic or the analyst and their understanding and so so we have all these different types of meaning all these that, that and, you know every individual sees something different hears something different and comes to understand uh, these artifacts in a different way there's also this idea of interpretive communities, interpretive communities. So um, this has to do with um, a, a couple of different things that, that uh, are foundational aspects of communication. So first of all, understanding that words have no meaning until they're read or until they're, they're seen. So words themselves um, don't have any meaning. That meaning comes only through interpretation. Right? So the words themselves are not magical. They don't have any meaning. That meaning comes from our understanding and our shared understanding and our connection, our interpretation of those words and of those images, right? It's kind of like Schrodinger's cat, right? If you're familiar with Schrodinger's cat experiment or thought experiment, right? Is the cat alive or dead? Well, the cat is both alive and dead, meaning is both there and not there until we uh, look at it and understand it, right? Or if there's a, a tree that falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make any sound? I don't know, do words have any meaning if we're not interpreting them or if we're not having a shared understanding of what they mean? So, yeah, this, the words have no meaning in and of themselves. It comes through um, this, this shared understanding, right? Through, through interpretation and shared understanding. Now, even beyond that, beyond individuals, 
that groups then with shared cultures will interpret artifacts similarly. So we see an example of this, for example, if you look at the different uh, major news outlets right now, major uh, television news outlets, you can almost tell from talking to somebody which one they subscribe to, if any of them, right? If they, it, you can tell if they're getting their news from Fox News or MSNBC or CNN almost based on how they talk about things and how they experience or, or speak about different current events and things. So uh, because groups with these shared cultures will interpret artifacts similarly. If you are a Fox News person, you're likely to see an event in one particular way. If you are an MSNBC person, you are likely to see it in a different way, right? Or maybe have a different interpretation of that. But that interpretation will likely be similar to those who also watch whatever media outlet you're watching. So then as an extension of that, especially now, as we've been talking, as we, as I mentioned before, creators, texts, and audience are born of these groups. They, they come from within that, right? People watch Fox news and then they go out and make their own things. Right. And, and so as, as the paradigm collapses, then this distinction between creators and audiences, there's far less of a, a specific divide. When I was growing up, there was a very specific divide. There were the creators, right? Uh, the news creators, for example, the, the, the news anchors and news teams that, that did that. And uh, so they were, they were all of these people. And then there was me, the audience. I, I was not a creator at that time. I didn't really have the opportunity to, that was not something we did or, or had access to. Right. So, um, but now that has really collapsed. Okay. The, this, this, uh, that, that distinction between these things has, has collapsed. Um, and so people are now creators. We have, uh, you know, the citizen journalist and, and people that are creating this media now, uh, whether or not they are in that professional field. And so um, now you have people that are part of those groups, right? People from the Fox News audience, from the MSNBC audience or whatever, that are becoming creators on social media and on YouTube and on different things like that. So they are these interpretive communities then that are kind of bonded together and share meaning um, and share an understanding because of the way they get their media and then the way that they create their media as a result of that. Okay. One other aspect of reception analysis that, that bears um, examination is ethnography, which is just a qualitative research method focused on understanding a cultural phenomenon from the perspective of, of members of that culture. So essentially, um, ethnographers will sort of embed themselves in a culture and in a community for a fairly long period of time so that they really come to understand and have a full understanding of, uh, of the way that they communicate. And specifically, it started with coding in terms of the language that was used, how they use language and things. Now it's expanded a little beyond that. But the, the principle is that you, you really embed yourself and become a member almost of that community so that you can examine it and you can uh, fully understand it then. Okay. So ethnography, um, examines things then from the perspectives of the members of that culture. Okay. So um, one of the more famous um, examples of ethnography came from David Morley, um, who and his uh, what was called his nationwide study. Nationwide was a news program in the UK. And so David Morley embedded himself in a community and examined the impact of this uh, um, a nationwide program, program called Nationwide. And so it was a news program. So we looked at it, but the, basically the idea is that there are three kinds of um, responses that people are going to have to a program. That's what this, this is his conclusion. There are three kinds of responses that people are essentially going to have, uh, and they're going to fall somewhere on the spectrum. Um, the dominant kind of perspective uh, is that is one that matches the intended or preferred meaning of the creator. So it kind of follows along. So I know some people who just for, I, well, on both sides, I know people on Fox news who watch Fox news and people who watch MSNBC who do the same thing. And just whatever um, is said there, it's what they, they take it as gospel. They fully agree with it. it their, their understanding then matches the, the intended um, meaning or, or what that, that outlet hopes that they will uh, understand from that or take from that. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's also then the opposite of that, which is not surprisingly called oppositional. So this counters or rejects the intended or preferred meaning of the creator. So if you are an MSNBC person and you're watching Fox News, you are likely to be oppositional to their uh, to their message. Right? You're likely to reject that or counter that and vice versa. Right. If you're a Fox News person, you're watching MSNBC, you're likely to do the same thing. Most of the time, though, 
uh, audience members fall in this in the middle of that somewhere, which is what we call negotiated. Right? Um, negotiated is the most common um, perspective, uh, and it's a mixture of the dominant and oppositional views, um, where the receiver kind of meshes the details of an artifact um, with their own frame of reference, and then they create meaning. They decode it and they create meaning based on their own frame of reference. So, you know, it'd be. I'm not really a Fox News person or an MSNBC person. I don't know that I'm any kind of person. I like, I like the news, but um, they're both pretty extreme for me. So if I were watching either one of those, though, um, then I might have a negotiated viewpoint where I, I accept some of what they're saying and I reject other parts of it and as it fits in with my uh, view of the world and understanding of, of how things uh, work and how they should work. So I'm probably going to you know, take some of it in and reject others. And, and that's how we respond to most media it's pretty rare for us to actually just let it wash over us and say yes everything is absolutely true that this person is saying but um to some degree we're probably having some sort of negotiated um, reaction or experience then so some common questions that come up in reception analysis include how do the responses of individual uh, audience members um, to this artifact vary what differences or which differences are representative of polysemy and which are representative of polyvalence? How do the responses of the individual audience, um, audience members to this artifact converge? How do they come together and, and intersect? Uh, is this convergence indicative of an interpretive community? Uh, which and how so? So, in other words, is this just, just a random coincidence or, or a collection of, of these intersections? Or is this something that really is something that goes a little deeper, that there's some um, real connection and, and, and connective tissue amongst this that creates that interpretive community? What ethnographic codes seem to accompany the interpretation of this artifact? So a lot of times we look at specific language that may um, be associated with this or, or uh, you know, phrases that may have significant or, or specific meaning um, to people who are a part of that group and part of that culture. And how do audience members use the various ethnographic codes to interpret the artifact? And how do you know? So I'd like to take a look at uh, an example of how we can apply these questions. And I'd like to use the show, the X-Files as an example. It's an older show, but uh, you know, from the nineties, but, um, but I think it provides us with a really good example. If you're familiar with the X-Files, it's these two FBI agents who examine cases that are sometimes a little out there. And, uh, and, and so, um, but they track down these things. And, uh, and so there's some longer term, um, storyline threads that go through it and there's also individual um, episodic type cases but uh, so but it was really incredibly popular in certain circles in the 90s but uh, it was on for quite a while and I said a couple movies made a comeback and, and different things but uh, so I will admit that I was originally <clears throat> fanatical about the X-Files I loved the X-Files and, and had a group of friends that did as well so I'm going to examine it kind of from, from that perspective so uh, so common questions. So let's take a look at these again. How do the responses of individual audience members to this artifact vary? I will tell you there's a wide uh, array of responses. First of all, just, I mean, just on the surface that some people really love the show. Like me, I was really, really into the show, loved it, watched it all the time. And it was very important. It was, it was uh, appointment, you know, reservation viewing for me. And there were other people who just hated it. My, my, you know, I had lots of friends and people who just didn't like it, didn't understand it, didn't care for it at all. So you've, on just on the base level, you had people who really enjoyed it and people who did not. Um, and so, but then even within the, the, the community of people who enjoyed the X-Files, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of variance to how people uh, viewed it and how people have viewed the episodes and which characters you liked and which you didn't and how you saw how things were going to unfold all those types of things so there was a lot of variance to uh, to this artifact from different uh, audience members uh, in different communities uh, which differences are representative of polysemy and which are representative of polyvalence so i would say in, from my perspective again there was a lot of polysemy there were a lot of a lot of different meanings and that was intentional there were a lot of like hidden things and subtexts and and little uh, you know breadcrumbs that, that were left all over the x files to, to you know that you could try and pick up on and and so there was a lot of polysemy and there was a lot of talk about how to interpret those things and and uh it was a big part of why people enjoyed the show, the people that did enjoy the show. 
And now, which are representative of polyvalence? That's a really interesting question. And one I don't know that I'm prepared to answer, to be honest. Um, this is not, again, this is not a, a really in-depth study on my part. So, and as somebody who is part of kind of the dominant culture, to be honest, I'm a middle-class white heterosexual male. And so I don't know that I'm you know, prepared to speak on polyvalence for this and how it was interpreted in, in especially in marginalized communities, um, because I'm not a part of that. So uh, that would be an interesting question to study, I guess, or to, to look at how it was um, um, uh, viewed in, in terms of polyvalence and what impact that might have had. How do the responses of individual audience members to this artifact converge? Um, there were a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of intersection. I'll tell you my group, we, we again, this was group viewing. We, we all met at my house. There were probably eight of us that watched the show together. I don't remember this before DVR. So you really had to watch it. We could, we could tape it on our VCR, but, but, uh, we had to watch it live. So we, we had these live viewing parties every week at our house while I was in college and, uh, eight or eight or nine of us would get together and there would be a lot of, uh, convergence in terms of the response. I mean, again, we all love the show. That's why we all watched it. But uh, um, so while there was a lot of divergence with the specifics of, you know, uh, the different theories about what was going to happen within the show, um, our, our responses constantly converged in terms of our appreciation for the writing. And, and um, so I think I think our responses did converge in that group. I'm um, not again, there was a lot of divergence and, and this was a very polarizing show. But within that that group, there was some convergence about in terms just in terms of how we enjoyed it and and uh, uh, that we wanted more is it indicative of an interpretive community in my case it certainly was absolutely was we were an interpretive community and uh, uh and we didn't necessarily create stuff as a result of that again that was still early on the internet was pretty new even so um but we were definitely an interpretive community in terms of uh, having a mutual appreciation, mutual understanding, mutual um, enjoyment of the show. So, what ethnographic codes seem to accompany the interpretation of this artifact? There were phrases. I mean, there was you know um, things like there was a character on the show who was constantly smoking, and he was kind of in the shadows all the time. He's very mysterious, and so he became known as a cancer man, right? Just just colloquially among the audience, and and that picked up steam. And one time, I think they actually referred to him as a cancer man in the show. Then, as a result. But there were things like that, that you use these codes, you know, the truth is out there and cancer man and different things like that. And people would understand if they were fans of the show, they would understand. Um, so there were there were some ethnographic codes, I think, that uh, that were a part of that, even even if it's just looking at the language around it. And how do the audience members use the various ethnographic codes to interpret the artifact? So we would look for, again, there were lots of breadcrumbs, lots of things. You had to pay very uh, specific attention to how things were phrased and what people said and what they didn't say. And, and even things like the time on clocks tended to be important. And, and you know, so there were all kinds of things. You just had to, to really pay attention to these things. And only, but if you were a member of that culture, you would do that and you would know those things. But um, but we, if you weren't a part of that culture, then none of that would make any sense to you. You really had to be a part of that culture. So, um, okay. I hope this gives you some understanding of reception analysis, some, some clear understanding of what we're looking at here with reception analysis. So you can understand that, uh, it's really a fascinating aspect of media that's, that's still evolving and still coming to be understood the impact and the role of the audience in understanding and making meaning of those artifacts. If you have questions about reception analysis or any other type of uh, critical lens for critical media studies, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that this gives you, again, another critical lens, another tool for your critical media studies uh, and, and analysis tool belt.